Hello and good evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Putt and I'm here to welcome you to BAFTA Film Sessions Casting. Uh, this virtual series celebrates the nominees from this year's EE British Academy Film Awards. Um, some housekeeping before I introduce our fantastic guests and nominees. Um, please do feel free during the course of this session to join the conversation on social media using the hashtag EEBAFTAs, all upper case. And if you've got a question, then please use the Q&A function if you're joining us on Zoom. And if you're with us on Facebook or YouTube, please put your questions in the chat. Also closed captioning is available, which you can turn on on the bottom of your screen via the CC button. So without further ado, let me bring the fantastic nominees in. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to Alexa L. Fogel, who is the casting director on Judas and the Black Messiah. Welcome, Alexa. And then Julia Kim, who was the casting director on Minari, and Shaheen Baig, who cast Calm with Horses. Welcome all three. Uh, sadly, we were due to be joined by Lucy Pardy, but she's unable to join us this evening and sends her apologies. And I'd also just like to mention that Lindsay Graham Ahanuhu and Mary Vernu were also nominated for their work on A Promising Young Woman, but are unable to join us today. So fantastic to have you here. Um, just like to start off with some sort of general questions, because I think for a lot of people, even, even when they've been in the industry quite a long time, casting is a bit of a, a mythical craft. So we're hoping you're going to debunk some of those myths for us and, and, and share with us some of your process. So Alexa, if I can start with you, what do you look for in a script? And for example, with, with Judas and the Black Messiah, what, what attracts you to a project? What attracted you to this project? You know, it's a funny question. I think that um, what I look for in some ways is something that I want to see. And in terms of challenging myself, it's really about, um, you know, not doing everything that I've already done <laughs> to some degree. Um, and in the end, it's really just about good writing and characters. That's what I'm drawn to. Yeah. And, and Julia and Shaheen, would you agree are the specific things you're looking for when you read scripts? For me, I, um, I love to feel that I can make a contribution. Um, there's something about these characters that I spark to that I feel um, have a unique quality and that I could go out there and find somebody um, that's going to really break out or to really enhance the story, uh, give somebody else an opportunity to shine. So, but something about the characters that feels like I could really make a contribution. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with, with both Alexa and Julia. It's a combination of the story, the script, the characters. It's also looking uh, to do something I haven't done before in, or in an area that I haven't I haven't worked before um, and then also that element the element that's really exciting to me is the discovery or the sort of you know the break the breakthrough element of it so it's a sort of combination of all those things excellent I, I think I I always think of the material as my real boss so that's who you're working to you're working to that script to that material yeah very interesting and 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 at what stage do you like to come on board, Alexa? You know, really, really, really early on? You know, how, well, you how soon do, uh, do people get you involved? Holding the purse strings. But uh, it depends on the material. Some things require a lot of lead time, um, particularly if you're looking, you know, for actors, characters that aren't as, you know, represented or seen. It really does depend on what it is. Some things you need more time and some things you have no choice but get thrown into the deep end immediately. <laughs> I 
And especially if you're looking, if you're searching for young people or kids, you can often start the process really, really early on. And sometimes we're brought on projects, even for a script written, you know, it could be in the process of being adapted from a book or so really, really early on. Um, yeah, and sometimes literally six weeks before, okay. which, is, you know, which is not the <laughs> ideal. Really. Challenging, <laughs> challenging. And Julia, do you, do you like to come on pretty early as, as, as well? I mean, with something like Minari, was, was that a, a long search, particularly for, for David, the, the little boy? Uh, well, I was just laughing at what Shaheen said. Uh, sometimes you do not get a lot of time. So uh, for such a big uh, assignment uh, where I had to find a bilingual, a, a, a seamlessly bilingual Korean American kid that could speak both Korean and English, um, they brought me on. I, I had about five weeks to find these kids. And uh, Looking back on it, I really don't know how it all came together, but I just hit the ground running. Um, I'm a Korean American born in Los Angeles, and I had a personal connection to the material, and I really understood what Isaac was trying to um, say in the story and what kinds of kids would be successful in telling it. And so I went to the local Korean newspaper that is read by... Um, it has a very, you know, uh, big readership. And so I went and uh, they were able to put an article out the very next day. And um, I had schools. This was pre-pandemic. So I was able to actually go and get go into the community and go to churches and schools and language schools. There's a Korean language school in town. And I just kind of stood around um, with the parents who are waiting to pick up the kids. And... Um, just kind of keep a really discreet, uh, you know, hang back and just see the kids filling out and, 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 and approach the ones that I felt would be promising. I love the idea of a senior casting director hanging around by the school gate. That is a, <laughs> well, a great I mean, image. Exactly. I think we've all done that. We've all done such unconventional sort of mad things to find the right people, especially when you're searching for young people. I mean, you have to just go everywhere and do everything. Yeah. It somehow seems safe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and like Shaheen, pull, while you're driving, pull over. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Shaheen, is it is it important that that your vision, if you have a vision of of that project when you've read that script, you know, aligns to the director's vision? Is that a conversation that that you will have early doors with a director? Um, we will have a conversation early doors about how about the sort of um, our own, you know, what we, you know, what I've taken from the script, my sensibility, my relationship with the material, and then their relationship, and then we discover it together. I mean, you know, in, in an ideal world, the collaboration starts then, and then we go on the sort of road of discovery together, because also casting can. Often, you know, a role can be written in a particular way on the page. It's not until you start searching or you start auditioning actors do you realise if that if that works, or actually someone sometimes an actor can come in and completely change the direction, often of a character. So you discover as you go along. I think initially um, you have to figure out if you're a good fit with each other. Um, you know, me and the director, if we fit, and if we kind of we feel we can go on the journey and then you discover together. I ha this is such a fundamental point. And I think it's something that, you know, people who don't do this don't really understand about casting. I, I, I think the process itself unfolds as you go and as you learn. So it's not, it's not as though some preconceived notion you have at the very start is what you end up with. Yeah. Very true. That, that shifts and changes in, in your vision for the project as that process unfolds. Yeah, as you come to understand, you know, the emotional arc of the character or what mm. in the material really is the, what really works well or what is really necessary to connect with, it, it's, it happens as you go. So, so Alexa, with a project like, with a film like Judas and the Black Messiah, 
was the one element what's the what's the timeline how did that work as as a process can you walk us through that to some degree i mean there was not <laughs> there was not much time um but shaka and i already knew each other shaka king mm -hmm. and i think that that is very helpful in terms of having a sort of pressure cooker, which was the budget, which was the schedule, which was, you know, the deadlines that we were up against. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the, the timeline, I suppose what I'm getting at is, is for example, you know, with with the, the, the two lead um, actors, the, the characters, Fred and Bill, and, and I suppose Roy Mitchell as well, did that happen simultaneously? Did one come in and, and then others? How did that work? And then, you know, to build that very big supporting cast around them. Which was primarily what we were doing in the time up to shooting when the studio finally decided to green light it. Daniel and Lakeith were already on board, but from Jesse Plemons, the Roy Mitchell character on down and, and, you know, I've done some things like this before where you have a lot of characters who are the same age and the same gender and you have to, and they have pivotal scenes, but not a ton of screen time. And you have to really find a way with the director of making sure that um, you can clearly delineate between, you know, what is it that makes these characters unique? It, it, it feels like it was a whirlwind. I'm sure it wasn't entirely, but I think because Shaka was so, He's so open to what actors bring, but he's also incredibly clear about what he needs. And that's a wonderful and rare combination. Uh, so it was, it was pretty fast, it feels as though. And there were a lot of pressure cooker moments in terms of the budget and how little we actually had. Um, but it was, it was, I think it was probably about eight weeks Wow, it's so much faster than I would have imagined. And Shaheen, what was that, that timeline like for you on, on Calm With Horses? Yeah, I think it was sort of similar, really. I mean, you know, Calm With Horses is an independent feature mm. film with a very small contained budget. So there wasn't, we didn't have a long lead in at all. Um, and so I think I probably, I mean, I'm trying to remember life before the pandemic. And so my whole concept of time is gone. But I think I was probably on it. You know, I think I probably came on board properly. Um, you know, often we do a bit of consultancy and a bit of development, but sort of actively, I think I probably came on board um, maybe three months, mm. three, you know, about three months before. And did you and then you sort know? of go for it? And Barry in mind at an early stage or did that come to you? Barry, Barry was always in everyone's mind from, from yeah. quite early on but for the role of Arne no you know it was sort of we met quite a lot of actors some brilliant actors um, but it was a process of auditioning and then once and we were also looking for Ursula sort of at the same time so we were we were doing them both at the same time then once we kind of found Cosmo we then put, you know, Cosmo with our sort of, with, the, with our short list of actresses for Ursula. So we were kind of doing it at the same time. And then we were also doing the, started the search in Ireland for Jack, for the little boy to play Jack. Um, so it was sort of, we were running all of those things at the same time because we had to. And, and was the same true for, for you, Julia, in terms of that supporting cast, you know, the, the local community in Arkansas? Was that all happening simultaneously with looking to kind of create the family? Uh, yes. I mean, um, Stephen was always in the conversation and he jump started the project. So we knew we were building from him as a patriarchal figure to the family. And then... Um, you know, the political waters of, of international travel were a little sticky at the time. And our two um, female actresses of the family were in Seoul, Korea. So that was never a given that they were going to make it over. So um, even though the focus was the kids and the big challenge was finding the kids, I still had to keep in mind that um, a grandmother and a wife, um, mom, 
might need to be found here in the States. So there was a lot of simultaneous uh, finagling going on, but my main focus was the kids. Yeah. Um, and we and we just uh, we started the virtual casting way before, you know, we're doing it now because um, the kids were all over the place. So we had um, multi-city chemistry reads, and uh, we were fortunate enough to have the kids in town. Um, we would uh, really work with them. Um, a lot of them did not have any acting experience. They were truly plucked from just a school or an after-school program or a church. And so we really handheld each child and walked them through the process. It was really fun. Yeah, sounds amazing. Can, can you talk us through what that, what that process is of building? Because, you know, you are not just finding individual actors, you know, who are believable in and of themselves, but also creating a family that you as an audience, which we absolutely did, buys into as this absolutely real family that exists. How, how do you experiment with that? How, how do you kind of get to that point? Well, because Isaac really had an intimate understanding, it was loosely based on him and his sister. He knew the qualities that he was looking for in these kids. Um, you know, David just had to be a very lovable Hellion. He needed to be um, charming and lovable amidst the naughty antics that he's up to in the script. And that was really important that the audience um, was delighted with his sometimes misbehavior and little, you know, um, pranks and things that he would pull um, on the parents or the grandparents, on the, on the grandma. So um, the process was we brought him in and we, basically created this pretend world for them and, and saw uh, if they could understand, um, pretend and, and understand that they're in this situation and how would you act in this situation and how would you talk to these faux family members um, and just really improv, um, a lot of improv and seeing if they could um, pull that off and, and give them a situation and see how they would act. Um, we had sibling quarrels. Um, how would you fight with your pretend sister? And um, all, all kinds of really unique exercises that I learned a lot from as well for my next round of kid casting. <laughs> and and, and Shaheen, would you go through a similar process in terms of Jack and the rest of the cast or how did how did you work on you know what was going to kind of build that believable dynamic I think once we had we had cast Arm and Ursula then you know obviously the search was happening in Ireland in exactly the same way as Julia you know we were searching in communities schools I mean we you know we needed a really really little kid and actually Killian who played Jack is, was five when he did the film so wow. they were very small kids that have never done it before so we were looking in all kinds of random places and I was working with a brilliant guy Nick in Ireland who was helping us and you know he literally were just no stone unturned and so that was happening in the background then once we sort of really kind of zoned in on Cosmo and Neve for for arm and Ursula then we were like okay now we've got to create the family and we sort of had to start there um but then we and then but you know with those in mind we could then start to sort of sh visually shortlist the kids and go right okay well these this group of kids look like they could be part of this family mm -hmm. um but it's a you know with kids it's it's a lengthy process and also you're slightly nurturing them through the process mm -hmm. um and they're families because they've never experienced this before um, and it's about really creating making it as fun as possible and making it as safe as possible so with kids that little that they feel you know you're not asking them to act it's just you're playing it's all about play and then by the point by the time we we you know just before we started filming Cosmo and Neve spent a lot of time with with, with Killian who's playing Jack so that they could then, the three of them, start to form their own bond. Wow, it's a really, it's so much more intricate and involved a process 
than I think a, a lot of people realize. And Alexa, for you working working on a project like this that that is based on reality, it's based on people who exist, existed, events that that happened. How important is the reality in terms of the, the characterization? How closely do you, as a casting director, study or do you not, you know, speeches, footage of those actual people? Or is it still much more about the script? What's, what's the balance there? You know, not, not everything that I've done that is based on real people and real events, it's not always the same. In this case, uh, I think the script really ruled and some of the people were based on, obviously on, on real people and some were composites. Of, and I think that what was important was to really try and understand what Shaka was getting at in terms of creating this community of people in what would only be a two hour film as opposed to you know a longer form. Um, so I. I pay attention to it, but in this particular case, I knew that he had made some choices, that they had made choices as writer to make sure that the essence of everything that was true was there. But no, it's not about finding someone who's exactly, I mean, he, he was encyclopedic about it. This one was 6'5", this one was, but um, there were times I think when actors brought what he needed to tell the story and that became sort of the rule of the day. Right, so that so yes, it's 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 characterization rather than impersonation. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to do anything that seems in opposition to the the, the facts of the story that you're telling. Obviously, you're very mindful of it, but uh, in this case, this is also a very little known part in our American history, which is horrifying. Yeah. Um, and so it's really also about making sure that you're helping to put it out there in a way that people will be able to really see it and feel it. And, and Shaheen, to sort of pull it back to a slightly more, more general question, you know, I'm, I'm sort of aware that, that as casting directors, you're doing, you're researching all the time. You're kind of looking for and looking at, you know, emerging and new talent. It, is that a very kind of regimented process for you about going to theatre, going to Fringe, watching indie movies? How how do you do that? What's your, your process around kind of refreshing your own talent pool, in essence? Um, I think it's, there's no one way to keep on top of that. I mean, it's sort of, we are consuming in all the time, in all shapes and forms. And it's not just us, it's, it's the people who work with us, you know, it's so it's the whole, like my whole team, we're, we're constantly watching whether it's film, television or theatre, you know, theatre has been online for a year. So, you know, it's whether it's doing that. I mean, there's so many platforms now to, to watch. It's sort of slightly overwhelming, but, you know, it's sort of and television has sort of gone completely off the scale and so we just try and consume as much as possible you know film festivals are a really good play way for me to sort of in terms of internationally keep an eye on things but we're always you know it's like I can't read a newspaper without clocking and banking some information or you know listening to the radio or watching the, you know documentary we're always taking in and 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 sort of um storing <laughs> faces yeah. and, and it's so it just feels like it's a it just feels like a way of life rather yeah. than a, a daily I need to do this it's just something I've trained my brain oh, yeah. to do yes yeah. Finding something that you uh, want, that I don't you... know about go ahead go ahead I'm sorry well, I was just gonna say like it is it's a constant um I have on my phone so many folders of lists and a commercial that I watched a long time ago. Um, there's a girl that's a, a prime candidate for something that I'm working on now. And I remember her from the Discover credit card commercial that she was in years ago when she was uh, aspiring to be an actress. And so um, it's a constant food uh, feeding fest of actors. And um, I never not think about it. And I, I'm sure my colleagues agree. 
Yeah, Alex. No, I was just going to say when trying to find something that you're watching purely for pleasure, not using that part of your brain gets very obscure. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I know a lot about Scandinavian crime dramas at this point. <laughs> and yet, it's, it's always work. There too, because you're like, oh, well, they, they're very good and I'm sure they speak English. And <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it literally, I will watch really kind of mundane cooking shows as a way to just completely switch off. I don't have to think about anybody I'm watching because nearly every other piece of television or film I watch, I'm thinking about the people I'm watching. So but you might just find that amazing non-actor in that cooking show. <laughs> true. You never know. And, and, and Shaheen, with somebody like what, like um, Cosmo, he's not Irish, is he? So no. How- not How does that work, you know, in terms of, 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 of was he doing the audition in, in an accent straight off? How do you work with, with accents and when you're specifically choosing somebody who hasn't got the accent that actually maybe the rest of the cast do have? Yeah. Well, with this, with Calm With Horses, you know, I wanted to cast as much as possible from within Ireland. And that was really important to the whole team. But we needed someone for arm who could carry the film. So we saw a mix, you know, some actors were Irish and some weren't, but it was a very um, specific accent they needed to be able to to master. And when Cosmo came in for the first audition, you know, he came in with an accent that he prepped and that accent only got better and better and better to the point when he went over to... um, to do some rehearsal and prep. And he went ahead of the the whole production and just sort of arrived in in the village where we were filming in character and just started, you know, talking in the accent. And nobody, you know, locally, they didn't realize he was an actor that he was gonna be in a film. And then three weeks later, the production turns up and everyone goes, oh, hang on a minute. That's that guy's gonna be in the film. And he just carried it through. And, you know, obviously it it was a gamble in some respects because it was a difficult accent and we knew that he was going to be surrounded by Irish actors. So he, he had to get it right. And his prep was extraordinary. And he just completely threw himself into it. So we had a sense from the first audition that he got, he, he was able to sort of navigate the accent and then it just got stronger and stronger. Wow. And, and Julia, if I can go back to, to, to just a, a further question about um, your child actors. So something like, and actually I'm I'm sure all of you have had experience of this, where you are putting a non-actor, a a child new to acting into a situation like where the grandmother has the stroke and then the the incredibly powerful scene at, at the end as well. You know, where the children need to be moved, they need to be distressed. How, how is, is that managed? At, at, do you ex- go through that process whilst before casting to make sure that, that those, those young actors will be able to deal with that? Is that something that you have to take into consideration when casting? We do. Um, I think the director, uh, we work with the director on selecting key scenes that show some range and um, different situations and see if the child can grasp uh, either the tragedy or the um, celebratory moments. Um, We did put uh, the young David actors through um, where they're afraid they're going to die and uh, really bring the emotion there. And then there's also a scene where he gets reprimanded by his father and has to be disciplined. And Stephen, at that point, when we've narrowed it down to our our top choices, he came in and graced us with chemistry reads, uh, Stephen Yen. And I asked him if he was going to do that scene where he had to really be a stern father and instill some fear in his child. And he said, "Um, I'm going to hold off on that part. Um, I think I'm going to just get him comfortable with me first. Um, And then when we get the actual child, um, you just kind of feed them little by little and you don't want to overwhelm them, especially actors who, you know, children who've never acted before. 
Um, and then I know that on set, they all had dinner together. Um, once we cast the actual family, they had dinners together and they just spent as much time together as possible to create this symbiosis and um, genuine family chemistry. So it's, it's a slow process and you feed them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you do play around a lot. And, and Alexa, as a, as a casting director, does, does your, well, all of you, does your role end when the director, the producers go, yeah, we, we wish to cast that person? Or do you, you know, this is something you've then been so involved in. Do you kind of visit the set? Do you stay involved? How does it work after the casting for you guys? Well, I think in anything where you have a lot of characters that aren't working for the entire film, you're on it through the time that they're shooting, the schedule changes, you have to rehire, you know, it's, it's a lot of administrative. So you're involved in all those practicalities as well. Yes, you are involved in all of that. <laughs> the tedious side of it, which is making sure people are available and the, these dates change. And, you know, I don't think any of us have worked on anything where the schedule you're given at the outset is what it actually is. At least I, it's never happened to me. <laughs> so yes, you are with it throughout. And, um, you know, and sometimes characters, I mean, this is a particularly big cast. So some characters might go away and something might be added uh, you know, in this case that you have to cast while they're shooting. Um, you know, it, it, you, there was a local casting director to do some day players, you know, the day players in the small roles. And there were a couple times when they couldn't find what they needed and they were well into casting and shooting. And so you have to, you, yeah, you have to stay on your toes throughout. And, and do you find that those actors, because I'm imagining as well for all of you, there are actors you've worked with and cast in, in various roles, that if there are maybe things that, that they would want to come back and discuss with you, even after they've been cast, that there's that sort of, is there that ongoing relationship with those actors as well for you guys as casting directors, Shaheen? I think it, it depends. I mean, obviously, um, you know, if, if you have first timers in, in, in your cast, then our job can go on for a really long time because you're, you're sort of, you know, there's a lot of pastoral care that goes, you know, that happens with casting. And so, especially if you cast a child, you know, you want to make sure that they're having a happy experience when they're shooting. You want to check in with them when the, the film is over. You know, who knows? They may want to do it again. They may never want to do it again. So there's a lot of care. And then with Calm With Horses, you know, I cast Cosmo in Lady Macbeth. Um, and so I, you know, I already had a sort of relationship with him and then I cast him this. So he is somebody that I will, you know, we'll check in with each other. I've known Barry for a really long time. Neve. So I think um, it all depends. You know, we, we you know, we, you know, we see actors time and time again auditioning for other roles. But if it's if you've been on a journey with that actor sort of from the beginning of their career, then you do check in with each other um, and you do, you know, they actors can ask you advice. And but especially if it's if you street cast someone or, you've, you know, it's a child and you've found them through a search, often our job can continue after the film has, has finished and into the future. Yeah. Yeah, so journey is a great word because that is very much what it is, not just with kids, but I found that when you cast someone in their first big part, um, you know, there's a lot of, you've been the touchstone through that entire process. And yeah. there's a natural um, inclination on everyone's part to make sure that they have all the information they need they know how to be playing something here instead of here. And I don't even mean that creatively because instinctually, obviously they do. That's why they got the role. But there are a lot of things that go into playing the lead in something that they may have never encountered before. And you're a safe place to check in and to kind of have that reciprocal relationship. So Julia, what, what do you enjoy most? about your job? I mean, all three of you obviously are so committed to what you do and are so fantastic at it. What's, what's the most enjoyable part of it? And if I might ask, what's, 
What's the most challenging part of being a casting director? Well, I'll start with the most enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> um, I enjoy collaboration. Um, I enjoy um, getting the script and reading it and envisioning, you know, just the initial names that pop into my head or the kinds of actors that I see for this and then having that discussion with the director and hearing whether we're on the same page or he had some other ideas and then that makes me broaden my um, mind about how that character is seen and um, just seeing it flourish and come to life is a really um, remarkable feeling and especially with Minari um, it was a film we never imagined would have the scope that of, of success that it's had um, it was a very humble and sweet story that um, many of us Korean Americans who were hired on it. And so in that respect, it was a, an extra special um, project because there were many of us who had a personal connection to the story. And, um, you know, uh, Alan Kim's mom and dad, I mean, they're living a life that I don't think they ever imagined. I mean, their, their, their child has just, kind of um, touch so many people and just hearing the people online talk about Alan and how much he's moved them. Um, I, I just don't think they ever imagined that. So that is really amazing too, to see that um, transformation that the family is going through. Um, and then Noelle, the other actress um, playing the sister, she's having a different journey, but um, I'm, I'm helping them navigate the inquiries that they're getting, they're not exactly um, ready to deep dive and have their kid be, you know, immersed in, in the film business and, you know, auditioning left and right. Like they still really want their kid to be a kid and, um, you know, they'll come out when it's something special and I'm kind of helping them with that. And, um, and then the down part is, um, I mean, I try not to take a lot of projects where it's just um, a name game. Um, I think that um, the name game part gets a little frustrating sometimes when you have to answer to uh, financiers or producers or studio that really want as many shiny names as possible and they may not always work creatively. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's finding that delicate balance of finding you know, making them happy, but then also making the creative part successful. Great. And similar for, for you, Alexa, in terms of what you enjoy and the challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think what I enjoy the most is that it's a creative puzzle that you have a, a, a pretty large part in solving. And it, when it all feels right and comes together, it's incredibly gratifying. And of course, that's the creative part that we all love doing. I mean, I think that the challenging part for me is that our, <laughs> our contribution, even within the business, is sort of undervalued. Um, and so there, there can be a kind of constant fight in terms of everything from our salaries to you know, a lot of other things. And I think that's historical. I think it's changing, but it's changing pretty slowly. Yeah, well, we've got 231 people here this evening from what I can see <laughs> at the bottom of my screen. So we can make sure we'll value this. And, and Shane, what about for you? Um, it's, a, it's so many things. It's, it's the collaboration with fellow artists, creators. I mean, that, you know, creatives, that for me is the most thrilling, thrilling part of the job. Um, also... You know, I love the discovery element, and I always have, of, of casting and rediscovery of, of, of actors. Um, and, you know, the, the dis and I often work in independent film, so, you know, it's sort of, you know, a lot of, you know, so you have less pressure in a way. You have less pressure to cast stars, and, and, and it's more um, open to discovery and new talent, and, and that's how we are going to achieve better representation. And so that's really, those are the things that really excite me. Um, is that really, is this sort of discovery and also just, 
you know, when you connect, when you click with a director, with a writer, with a team, it's just the most, I don't know, I feel very, very lucky to do the job that I do. I can't quite believe I'm still doing it and I still love it. You know, it's hard. It's really hard in this, especially at the moment, just trying to get films off the ground is a real struggle. And, and sort of the, the schedule in the budgeting will never be easy. <laughs> that will always be one of the hardest elements of our job. Um, and, you know, we are, as Alexa says, you know, we are sort of right at the beginning of the process, right at the beginning of a project coming together. And we are there all the way through to the end. And um, yeah, it, we are very, very much part of the process. You are. And I, I think also, you know, particularly looking at, at the choices that all three of you have made in, in casting these wonderful films and films that are, you know, about characters, about, you know, real people whose, whose stories are not probably told as much as many other stories and whose voices are not heard in the same way. It's obviously very important to all of you, you know, to represent those diverse voices, you know, and are, are there specific steps that, that you feel as casting directors you can take to increase that sort of di diversity and inclusivity in front of the camera in our industry? And do you feel that the industry is, is listening better now? I, I feel confident that all of us have that at the forefront of our minds or even in the background of our minds because we are open to lots of different versions of things. And yeah, I do think it's getting a little better. It could be faster. I mean, I think, you know, when you have a choice, you work with people who are open. Yeah. And we, you know, starting to see scripts that sort of reflect better the world that I live in and the people I know and the people I've grown up with and I'm wanting to see characters that I can relate to. Um, and that is starting to change. And it, it really is about storytellers. It's making sure that... Um, you know, the people that this industry finds to tell the stories are properly representative. I definitely see a nice shift in the kinds of materials I'm receiving and the conversations that we're having. And I just remember, you know, having a very short list of people to choose from when it came to a certain ethnicity. And those lists have expanded uh, you know, very much. So I see a change for sure. Good. That, that's a, a very positive note on which to, <laughs> I'll, I'm going to stop asking you questions, although I could go on for quite <laughs> some time. And I'm going to throw this open as I can see that we've got quite a few questions in the Q&A box. So in no particular order and kind of getting through as, as many as we can before six o'clock, um, from a lady called Isabella First. As a young filmmaker, I was curious to know what is the most helpful thing a director can do to encourage strong collaboration on a project? And if possible, can you think of any examples, Shaheen? Oh, to encourage. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think... Um, I mean, one of the things I'll say about, it, especially with first time directors, is really trust your departments and trust your, your HODs because you and your producer have employed them for a reason. You know, have employed your cinematographer, your editor, your art designer, your casting director because of their experience and because of their expertise. So really listen um, and and collaborate with them because the advice, you know, because their advice will be invaluable. So I think um, that's probably one of the things I'd say is really trust and lean on the, the, the people you put around you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we agree with that. <laughs> good. Uh, what are the, from Julian Alcantara, uh, what are the most misunderstood aspects of a casting director's role? Alexa, in what ways are you misunderstood? I think the biggest misunderstanding is that we pick people and that there isn't a process by which you continue to discover what 
the material is asking for and how to people the world. The world. I think that, you know, in, in lay terms, I think that that's just not um, clear. Thank you. Um, Kira on YouTube, what advice do you have for actors trying to get into the casting room? And what advice do you have for auditioning when the actor isn't given much backstory? Julia, can I throw this one at you? Sure. Um, well, you have to be right to the part <laughs> to get in the room. So um, I do get a lot, I'm sure we all get a lot of general emails um, like, hi, I'm a, you know, I've worked on a lot of Asian films and Asian American films. And so I have a lot of Asian actors um, just emailing me a headshot and saying, I'm out here. And that's, I, I love to know about new people, but I have to have something for you that you're right for. So um, that's how you get in the room. And then I believe if you do, I'm, I'm working on something now where I'm not really privy to get the script out. And so they, the actors really only have the scenes, the audition scenes to work from, and then a character description. And then on the scene, we give them a little bit of, um, you're in a job interview right now, and um, you're trying to put your best foot forward to give you a little bit of the tone. And, and then the rest is really um, just knowing the material inside and out so that um, as far as memorization, I believe that then when the director throws some curveballs at you and says, well, can we try it this way? Can we try it that way? You're not um, suddenly, you know, a deer in headlights going, I only practiced it one way and I, I'm not able to really be flexible and give you something different. Like you need to be able to follow any lead that the director is giving you. So I think a deep understanding of the material as far as memorization is really key. And I think also if you, if an actor has time, do your research the people you're gonna meet in the room. Mm -hmm. So if it's a casting director you've never met before, then have a look at their work. If it's a director you don't know, um, you know, just, or you know, just refresh yourself because I think you'll feel more in control and empowered in that situation if you feel like you have an understanding of who you're meeting. Excellent, thank you. Um, a question from Amina. Uh, so let me ask Alexa, if I might. When you are auditioning, do you take into account key emotional scenes or certain plot points in the script that may be challenging for an actor? Is this something you would cover off in an audition to make sure that the actor can achieve it on the screen? It, it depends on the character. Some characters walk through the scene, you know, and ask you if you'd like some water with your, you know, I mean, it really depends. If, if you're talking about leads, then you try and find a couple scenes that are contrasting and go speak to the essence of what you will ultimately need to see. I don't tend to use incredibly emotional scenes in auditions, unless it's maybe a recall, because I think it's too hard to replicate. And if you can see that there is, you know, true emotional life and you can get there, you know, with rehearsal over time, then mm. um, I hope that's an answer. Yeah, no, that, that, that sounded great. Um, a personal question, this one from Juliet Husson. Um, thank you so much for this insightful talk. Uh, I was wondering about your professional journeys. How did you become casting directors? Thank you. Uh, Shaheen, how did you, did you always want to be a casting director? I didn't know what a casting director was. I mean, I didn't study. I didn't go to university, so I didn't you know, study film or anything. Um, I just, uh, I started off working for a producer and a writer. They had a production company and I did work experience and they gave me a job. And then I worked with them and then I was looking for a new job. They knew a casting director who was Debbie McWilliams, who is brilliant and cast saw the, you know, James Bond films and um, went for an interview and she took a punt on me. So that's, that's how I didn't really, I knew, I always loved film. I'm very passionate about film. Um, 
and and I just sort of fell into it and then I worked with Debbie and then I worked with Gina Jay and Patsy Pollock and that's sort of how I came up through it but but um yeah I think my passion for film got me got me along <laughs> from one place to another the jump off point. Yeah, but I didn't really know I wasn't really fully aware of what casting was I just knew I wanted to work in film brilliant and, and Alexa how about you um, I still haven't decided what to do, but, <laughs> <Where you're going? laughs> but I studied directing in uh, college. I thought I was going to be a theater director and I went to work, but I didn't know what a casting director was, but um, I went to work as um, an assistant to an artistic director of an off, off Broadway theater. And in the middle of their, or right before the season started, the casting director left. So I had to kind of, jump in and as it turned out everything that I'd studied for was the skill set that I needed if I had known then what I didn't know then in terms of talking to agents and all of that I would never have done it but it was a good fit great <laughs> and and Julia how about you it was a bit of an accident for me too um I ended up answering an ad for an internship at a casting office it was really anonymous but it intrigued me and um, it ended up being David Rubin, who is the Motion Picture Academy president now and um, proudly a casting director. So um, I just fell in love with the process. Um, it was back in the old headshot days where you opened up every envelope and I just sat on the ground and I would get stacks and stacks delivered and I opened them up and that was my educational process of getting to know the agencies and getting to know the actors and what kind of agencies rep what kind of actors and the, the whole tapestry of casting towards a project really, really, I just fell in love with it. Wow, great, great journeys, everyone. Um, so next question from Emma Wellwood. Any specific tips for actors not to get scared or nervous or intimidated during an audition? Alexa? You know, I, I think that the answer to that, you know, while I hesitate to tell actors to spend more attention to themselves than they already do, I think it's really about knowing yourself well and where those limitations come in. Some people need to know the scene backwards and forwards because they're gonna lose 20% of what they worked on in the room. Um, some people don't have that issue at all. I mean, I think it really is about how, how well you know the material and just finding whatever those tips are for yourself, whether it's like yoga breathing or you know something, to just sort of calm yourself and try and be as present as you possibly can listen. You know, eventually that goes away. Um, but I think for young actors, it's about knowing where the place is where it drops off. I think right. also, you know, the, the you're in the room because the casting director wants you to be there. Mm. So there's huge, you know, value in that. So, you know, I, you know I want and I'm as nervous as an actor in the sense I want it to be a really good audition I want the actor to leave that space feeling like in the moment they did the best they they could do and they feel good with it so that we're on the actor's side always you know in in that situation and I think sometimes actors you know just when you're coming into the room remember that because mm -hmm. you know we're there to support them and it's a long game it's about a whole yeah. career. It's not about that one audition. Everybody does not great auditions. You don't, you know, get an X over you for that. Okay, this is a question that's been asked a couple of times in different ways. How have your jobs changed? How has the day-to-day -day of casting and being a casting director been affected by COVID and, and, and lockdown? And also somebody's asking, what's it like auditioning over Zoom? Julia, has, has your job changed markedly? Um, I believe all of ours has. Yeah. Uh, on one hand, it's great. We get to see so many more people because there's self tapes to go through and we can be more productive in the numbers. But we definitely, I, I do feel um, I miss the human contact. And there's things that you miss that aren't on a self tape, like um, 
you know, their body language when they're sitting still and not, not doing the dialogue, when they're receiving the scene, the back and forthness of it, um, just uh, the energy that you feel when somebody is in the room is just, you can't duplicate it online. But on the other hand, the actors can do it 26 times before they send in their best take. So there's a plus and a minus to what's going on. Um, but it's it's working. I mean, we're able, to, I'm moving forward. Um, we did it, at, like I was able to sample a little bit of the virtual casting with Minari because everyone was so spread out. And I think it was great to have that under my belt for what was this unexpected um, period of time where we have to do self tapes and virtual casting. But um, I look forward to being in a room again with actors, that's for sure. Gosh, I can, definitely. <laughs> I can say I love it. <laughs> I love it too. I do love it. I'm not doing any self tapes. I'm doing all Zoom auditions and I love the frame. And um, yeah, I have to say I, I, there's something efficient about it that I really love. The production part of it is much harder. Everything takes much, much longer. Um, and that is a drag because you have to you know, it's, it's hours every day. Okay. Well, I mean, like when it an made it more inclusive, kind of actually, it's a much more inclusive process because actors, so, you, know, you know, we're in London and it's very expensive for actors to come and go all the time. And so in yeah. a way it's made our pool much wider, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's just, you know, we've had to learn a new way of doing it and it's brilliant that it works, but it isn't for me quite the same as being in the space with actors and just getting the sense of them um, in the, in the real, you know, in a real way. And so it, I, I guess we will go back to a, we will end up doing a combination of the two things, I think, going forward, you know, recalls and screen tests, possibly in the room and um, first meets on Zoom. Maybe that's the way we will all be moving forward. But let's see. Um, I do. I do appreciate for actors at the moment, they've got such a huge volume of self tapes to turn over. It's sort of vast. And in a way, I'd say maybe approach it in the way you'd approach prepping for an audition to come in the room and don't spend any longer on it than that because otherwise it can be overwhelming. Brilliant. Well, time has defeated us um, and I think we are going to have to, to close now, but not before I have said on behalf of myself and I'm sure the other 200 plus people in this Zoom room, thank you so much to Alexa Fogel, Shaheen Bey, Julia Kim. It has been absolutely fascinating spending an hour in your company you've been brilliant good luck to all of you amazing well-deserving nominees um and and good luck on the night um just in practical terms for um our viewers here the next event in this series will be on editing at 7 p.m uk time and you can sign up to watch on bafta.org and we will also be streaming to the bafta social channels so have a wonderful evening, everybody. Alexa, Julia, Shaheen, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your days. And um, hopefully Bye. we'll meet you soon. Thank Bye. you. Congratulations. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>